my name is Taylor Parsons. Uh, my current role, uh, a little bit about me, is uh, I'm a United States Marine Corps veteran. Uh, I have six wonderful children. Uh, for those of you that are parents, you know what I mean when I say wonderful children. I coach youth sports, and I've been in the security industry uh, a little over 10 years at this point on the vendor side. Uh, before that, I was in the IT side doing system administrator work. And before that, in the military, I was actually doing security and infrastructure management. So I, I've spent a lot of time doing a lot of cross collaboration between IT and security teams, having had to do it myself. Um, so today, a lot of this is going to be based on my experience, uh, both as a vendor and as a provider, and uh, go having gone through my own experiences working between IT and security. The current role, uh, technical customer success at a company called Subco Security. Uh, we do IT asset intelligence. So really, you know, in my current role, whenever I was reached out to, this is one of the things that I've really had a large focus on, is helping to build relationships between IT teams and security teams, uh, you know, for simple things, just identifying how many assets you have in your inventory. Uh, what is your external asset um, exposure? And how do you really correlate all of that data? and make sure that you understand what your footprint looks like. And that that topic is so extremely broad that it's covered in so many different areas. You've got SIM, you've got, you know, EDR tools that you deploy to your environment. You've got, you know, your service nows with your CMDBs. You've got uh, your CASM tools, your uh, EASM tools. All of those different tools really encompass multiple teams and making sure that you're marching towards common goal and everyone understands what you're trying to accomplish. So, you know, being able to talk cross collaboratively between IT and security is a, a, an extreme passion of mine because without that, you don't have true success in, in your organization if you don't know what the goals are and what you're marching towards. So, today's purpose I, I really just want to talk through things, uh, make sure that we understand how we can build better. Uh, better relationships between the internal organization to operate smoothly and efficiently. But also with, with smooth and efficient teams, you have to be able to communicate openly and honestly. Uh, you know, on the, the last presentation, really talked uh, really talked about one of the key areas in raising risk or identifying risk and being able to talk about that within your organization uh, without fear of uh, reprisal or, you know, really having that uh, connotation that some security professionals get of ambulance chasing um, or just raising alerts to raise alerts. So two, two main questions that I really get is how do we get there and who's responsible for helping us get there? I break this down into five areas and we'll hop into those areas and really just kind of do a, a quick deep dive on each of the, the five areas that I've identified. And then hopefully by the end, we all understand you know, what we can do to build better relationships between our IT team and our security team. I think to, to no one's surprise though, the, the first area, if we're gonna build better relationships is we've got to learn how to communicate. Uh, we've got to make sure that we're communicating the same things and we have to make sure that we're communicating in terms that everyone understands. So I break this down into three areas. Uh, how are your teams interacting? What common goals do they have? And how does each team get in touch with the other one? Some ideas about team interaction. Uh, those things are Slack, um, Discord, uh, Cisco, uh, Cisco Jammer. Um, you know, there were Flowdoc back in the day uh, where everyone had custom names, but you've got these large areas and these large groups where everyone can post messages and they can talk about things but how much communication is actually going into those types of tools? Or are we just sharing cat, cat gifs and, and memes all day long without actually talking about some of the issues? So team communication tools can be a very good uh, tool for establishing guidelines for communication. They can also be a very large distraction. I know that I find myself mostly in the meme channel or posting pictures of my, my animals and my kids, but really, the communication aspect is one of the key fundamentals of, of making sure that you're building better relationships. Whenever you're able to communicate and you understand that you can build a relationship with someone, even if you don't work in the same organization and work on the same team, you have the ability to talk about what some of your what some of your day-to-day -day duties are, what your job is, and what 
you know, you're really goaling yourself or your team on. So if I'm introducing myself to someone on the sales team, you know, really understanding what they're looking to do, uh, understanding, you know, as a customer success representative, how my role impacts the day-to-day -day sales operation. Same thing happens in your internal teams with your IT and your security team. Hey, IT is going to, you know, send out an update for a, a Chrome patch, right? Being able to communicate that in advance so that the security team can understand, hey, we're updating our operating system browsers. Are there any known vulnerabilities? Are there any known issues with the update to this browser? But if we're not communicating and we don't know what's going on, security team can never weigh in on any potential zero days on browsers or any other issues that are, are getting patched. And then with that, the IT team doesn't understand why the security team is getting so frustrated if other issues arise and vice versa. If the security team is pushing updates, whether it's a new EDR tool or whether we're pus pushing new uh, policies on firewalls that could interrupt communications, and then all of a sudden the internal IT help desk uh, gets flooded with, I can't access the internet tickets. We don't know what's going on because left hand's not talking to the right hand. So being able to communicate, being able to talk about uh, challenges and day-to-day -day duties, that's really going to uh, eliminate those, those first two things and, and really help ensure that you're driving communication internally. And then the last one, uh, this one is a, a huge a huge milestone and a huge goal of mine is really breaking down the barriers between getting in touch in between the um, subsets of teams. So if you want to talk to IT and you, you have an IT issue, uh, typically you go to your help desk, you fill out a ticket, you provide all the information, that ticket gets triaged, someone responds, and they ask you for the next set of information or they provide you a potential solution. Internally, we run into a lot of those same issues, especially with people who have uh, large shops that include, you know, JIRA or project boards, um, as well as engineering tickets that often are classified as security tickets as well. And if we're, we're never actually having conversations, but we're only communicating through tickets, we don't know that we're necessarily passing the right information or we're talking the right way and we're understanding each other's goals. So really making sure that it's not just a ticket. Um, it's not just a ticket that you're filing and information that you're providing to another team, but giving them the context or the understanding of the background of why the issue exists or what we're trying to accomplish, that will help resolve a lot of issues and prevent you from running into situations where you're just going back and forth on that ticket. I'm sure everyone has had that, that one ticket that's gone you know, way too long with either a vendor or internally, where you just keep posting updates back and forth. And then rather than having a, a very quick conversation, you know, either on Zoom or face-to-face, -face, um, now that people are back in the office, we, ju we just kind of rely on our keyboard um, rather than resolving the issue. So breaking down um, communication is gonna be a huge thing. So the next thing, um, I already skipped to it, is resources. So from communication to resources, there, there's a broad jump. Um, resources has a lot to do with tools, a lot to do with the access to certain systems, and then understanding of funding as well, because even that can be an issue um, in between the security team and the IT team, they can have uh, disparate budgets. So there might be you know, tools that security wants that they don't have budget for, but the IT team does. Is there a potential for a crossover? Are they using the same tools? Is there a way that we can adopt the same tools and do a subset of each other's jobs while you know keeping costs down as an organization? So identifying those resources um, is a really is a really big thing between teams. Once you identify the the different tools and, and the different accesses that each team has, uh, that which goes along with the communication. Um, those start to open up a lot of different doors and a lot of different avenues of conversations because the way that IT people think and the way that security people think, which is a little bit paranoid, um, if we're all being honest, it, it gives you the ability to you know, expand your, your horizon and it really gives you the diversity and thought that every organization is looking for. Because if everyone is operating the same way and thinking the same way and we never challenge the norms, how are we ever going to progress and get better? 
So with resources and communication, it's a big jump because you're going from soft skills and having conversations uh, to working towards um, access to tools. How do we use the tools? How do we operationalize our teams? Uh, that, that's a really big jump um, in the idea, but making sure that you open those doors with the communication that really helps establish what you can and can't do as an organization based on what you currently have and pay for or you know, what's already been approved by IT um, and the security team based on you know, SOC audits, things like that. So now that, now that everyone's talking, now that everyone knows the tools that everyone's using, we move into responsibility. Responsibility is a very interesting area. Um, depending on your organization, depending on uh, how your teams are broken down and your reporting structure, responsibility can be a very gray area. We, we talk about it a lot on um, system outages. We talk a lot about it on breaches, um, you know, unintended access, account takeovers. There's all sorts of situations where responsibility really becomes part of the prime subject. And that, that starts with defining roles. Are the roles defined first? Does IT know exactly how they're operating and does security know exactly how they're operating? By definition, most of the time we do know. Uh, by execution, that, that line is often crossed. Um, we know that you know, for things like uh, vendor patching, so if, if I'm a security administrator, uh, we'll say I'm an EDR admin, and I know that you know in my entire fleet, I've got an older agent that's out there. It's been running for a while. Vendor comes to me and says, hey, uh, based on some recent releases, we really recommend that you go ahead and you start upgrading that agent so that you can take, uh, you can take ownership of uh, this new feature. A lot of times we'll, as security admins, we'll go, okay, we'll get that EDR agent upgraded. And without actually ever consulting with IT or consulting with the other teams, because we operate in that tool every day, because we know that we're responsible for that tool and how that tool operates, and we want to take, um, we want to use the new functionality in the release, we go ahead and a lot of times we'll push that update. Uh, whether it's within patching cycle or it's not within patching cycle, whether it's within a maintenance window at times, hopefully not your production servers, uh, but I have seen that done in the past before. Uh, we understand that, you know, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna take that action. But if the IT team is in the middle of a software audit or if they're in the middle of inventorying assets and we're rebooting machines and all of a sudden the counts get off, uh, now, we're, now we're kind of in the, IT, in the IT space because they know that they're responsible for soft, all the software installed on our corporate machines. So now we've kind of shifted that, that burden of responsibility back on the IT team without actually ever consulting them because we went ahead and we pushed that update from the console. Certain organizations have stop gaps in place uh, if you're using something like SCCM or Tanium that prevents um, install overrides. But a lot of times, uh, you know, we all get bogged down in the day-to-day -day and the minutia, and we really just want to start accomplishing goals uh, because at the end of the day, job satisfaction is, is a huge priority to a lot of people. So getting things done, um, Oftentimes, regardless of consequent, uh, you know, we're going to take that risk. So clearly defining responsibility um, and making sure that you're not overstepping boundaries, which could, you know, potentially ruin relationships, even if you're communicating, um, even if you, you've identified who's responsible for what tool and what accesses you should and shouldn't have um, between the two teams, we can often cross that line and, and it can make people uncomfortable. And that leads into culture, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, but these are, are key areas that we really have to define. A lot of that comes with open communication. And, and a lot of that starts top down as, as operators and as practitioners. You know, we're, we're so used to executing and doing things on a day-to-day -day basis that oftentimes we don't we don't look up from our desks until the day's done unless we're looking for that mental break or we're, you know, we've got a funny meme to post. Um, we, we really just, we want to work, 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 get things done um, and enjoy our time where we can. So oftentimes we're not worried about bridging ourselves out unless we see people above us doing it. So are your leaders having open, honest communication? Are they pushing open, honest communication between the teams? And then with that, you'll start to see, hey, I've got this EDR agent, you know, that I really need pushed. And the IT team will say, hey, 
uh, you know, I can fit that in. Um, let's test it on, on a couple machines, make sure that, you know, with everything else going out, we understand things are, are, um, you know, going to have interoperability issues at times, but let's go ahead and test out on a subset of machines and let's get in the next patching cycle. And all of that starts to build better relationships because you know that, you know, in the, in the event that you need it, you can rely on your counterparts across teams to really get things done. Uh, and oftentimes it doesn't have to become such a process oriented transaction. You can really, you know, just send them a quick message. Hey, I'm working on this. You know, is there room to potentially add this to, you know, the next cycle or is there an area where we can really start to operate in? But again, it, it comes from understanding, communicating, and, and defining roles. Skills. Uh, this, is, this is probably my favorite subject, um, to be honest. I've been a hiring manager. I've been an individual operator. I've been a team leader. And skills is probably the most diverse subject whenever you start talking about building better relationships. I myself, I've been in security uh, for you know quite some time. Um, I have a certain set of skills that I really enjoy and some that I'm really good at. Uh, talking to customers is something that I'm really, really good at. Um, defining priorities, oftentimes not my strongest suit. So I know that you know prioritization um, is a skill that I often lack because I want to get things done for people immediately. Um, instant gratification is one of those things that, you know, I really, I really like it. It helps me make sure that I'm providing the best service. I'm building the best relationships because I know that people are making decisions rapidly on a day-to-day -day basis. And those things are extremely important to people whenever you can give them quick answers or quick results to things. So skills, whenever you start talking about building relationships, um, goes back to responsibility a little bit, but it goes to cross-team collaboration. And cross-team collaboration is one of the most important things based on organizations. A lot of organizations in, in today's age with the uh, millions of jobs that both IT and security have open, cross-collaboration allows organizations to run leaner than they initially thought that they could. Because if, you're, if you have the ability to upskill um, and train people in areas that they didn't have experience in before, it allows you to rapidly grow your team um, for spin up, spin down situations. Maybe you're responding to a crisis. Maybe, you know, you're have a big audit coming up um, and you need extra manpower to, you know, inventory the assets or, you know, start um, reviewing network logs, or, you know, maybe you, you just really need to have a, a tabletop exercise and previously, maybe that person wouldn't have been invited to that exercise, but because you've been doing cross-team collaboration and you've been upskilling them, they have the ability to step in and, and alleviate some pressure on the team. So whenever we talk about skills, there, there's four areas um, that I focus on. How are your teams being trained? How are you hiring? And what are you doing to accomplish your target hires? What internal and external trainings are you providing? And what's your career growth plan? So how are your teams being trained? Uh, people learn in a lot of different ways. You've got auditory learners, you've got um, visual learners, and then you've got a mix of both. And then you've got people um, that can read and pick up a skill without ever having to practice it or to execute on it. I myself, I am a very hands-on learner. Um, so I need to put hands on a keyboard. I need to execute that script. I need to watch the output. Um, I need to install that package to, to see how it interacts with the machine. So I'm very hands-on, but I have people on my team which are very visual learners. Um, they like to listen to things. They, they like to really, you know, watch other people execute, but, you know, make sure that they're listening to the directions that they like to listen to the mouse clicks is, is what I call it um, as we're executing certain tasks. So how your teams are being trained depends on, you know, the, the type of learners that you have on your team, but it also depends on how you are trying to push the agenda of what you're trying to accomplish. So if I'm trying to train someone from the IT organization on how to, you know, install packages from 
um, one of our EDR tools, I'm going to make sure that, you know, one, I'm documenting um, just in case they need a reference back. Uh, I'm doing a walkthrough on a test machine so that they understand uh, how the platform works, how they can go through this, things to look out for. And then on, on the third time, I'm going to let them uh, do it and I'm going to reverse shadow so I can watch them execute. Uh, what that does is that creates repetitive skill pattern, uh, which creates proficiency, and then proficiency creates um, creates a, a, an environment where they're not afraid to take risk or to take action whenever need be uh, without having to be told to do so. A lot of that also plays into your hiring profile. Um, hiring profile is very interesting depending on the sector that you're in. Um, depending on what you're trying to accomplish and the role that you're trying to fill. Are you trying to uh, fill a junior role with someone fresh out of college or someone with very limited experience that's either gone through boot camps or you know they, they learn how to do IT in the military, someone like me, um, where you get experience to a lot of different systems and to a, a lot of different things without deep diving into anything. So you've, you've got to establish you know, what your job, job descriptions are and what you want that person to look like. Um, do and, and with that, I also really challenge people to challenge the norms of, do you have to have a higher education degree? Um, do you have to have the four to six years experience? Or is that something that was left over from previous job descriptions? So finding your, your target hiring profile and expanding the job search based on that and not limiting based on factors that don't play into uh, what the actual job execution is going to be uh, are all big things that are going to allow you to develop skills and employees that you might not necessarily have hired previously or promoted even um, because a lot of that is also uh, what goes into career pathing and we'll get into internal external trainings in just a second but career growth paths um, within your organization is a is a big big thing um, everyone wants to retain the right talent in their organization. So making sure that you give them the career path and you give them the ability to learn skills so that they feel like they're an asset to the organization and they have a way forward. All of those are huge things that really play into developing your organization and making sure that, you know, you've got talent sticking around for the long run. And then last but not least, internal external trainings. Um, I love internal training. Uh, it, it's one of my favorite things to do. I do cross collaboration team trainings. Um, we call them lunch and learns where we'll, we'll sit down for an hour, hour and a half. Uh, we'll go through, you know, a tool that we use, or we'll have um, the IT team go through a tool that they use, understand how they're using it and what they're accomplishing. And that gives us the ability to, as we develop further projects, rely on them to provide us skills um, and training to use that in the future. Um, project management is probably one of the key areas that uh, IT does a lot better than security usually. Um, IT project managers are usually a lot more disciplined in execution than security project managers because security project managers um, are a lot like security professionals and a little bit paranoid. So we wanna move as quickly as possible to accomplish the goal. Uh, whether it's getting all of your logs into SIM or whether it's getting all your agents installed, uh, we want to move at a very rapid pace because we want to make sure that you feel like you're getting value out of the security that's being provided. Uh, whether it's physical, virtual, um, endpoint, whatever it is, uh, we have that instant gratification that we're really looking for. Whereas IT, IT project management, uh, they really break things down in ways that are uh, consumable and really attainable over time. All of these things uh, lead into the most important thing whenever you start talking about building better relationships, and that's culture. Uh, starting with the company culture and understanding uh, what your company culture is. How do you guys operate? How do you guys communicate internally on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, not just from an operator and ex uh, executor leader level, uh, but all the way up to executive leadership. How are they communicating? How are they interacting with other employees? Um, company culture drives 95%, I would say, of day-to-day -day execution. If you come to work happy and excited for the company that you work for, you're going to be more efficient and more dedicated to executing your job responsibilities than if you 
don't like logging in in the morning. And a good company culture allows you to do a, a couple of things. Um, the first thing is challenging the norms. Um, I love challenging the norms. Um, I am very uh, pulverizing at times. I think it's because of my large red beard. Um, but either way, I, I challenge things because I like to make sure that we have enough diversity of thought that we're always doing the right thing or we're always progressing the right way. The way that we did things last year may not be the best way that we do things this year. And if I don't feel comfortable challenging that or asking if we're doing the right thing, I'm typically not going to raise my hand whenever I see an issue or if I see something that we're doing wrong. The ability to do that um, is based on having a healthy dialogue between teams. Um, that goes back to the communication aspect. Are we communicating? Are we understanding each other's responsibilities? Do we understand who has what skills to execute their job within that responsibility or that scope of what we're trying to accomplish? And are we doing it the right way? The other thing is security awareness. Um, everyone makes the joke about the sales guy clicking on the link. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that we've all been there at some point or another. And if it wasn't sales, it may have been marketing um, or it may have been an executive that either thought they were hovering on the link or they actually clicked that link. And it led to an incident that we weren't prepared for. And now we have teams asking, you know, hey, why did why did that why did that link make it through the email spam filter? Hey, why did the um, link actually traverse the Internet and why were we able to reach that site? What is that site? Uh, was there any data exfiltrated? Were there any credentials passed? Was there any PII leaked? Uh, we, we go into all of these conversations, all of these questions, uh, but it that also starts with good security awareness and making sure that security and IT aren't seen as gatekeepers or people that want to monitor everything that you're doing all day, every day, um, because we, we have responsibilities, but it's not to watch the end user like they think it is. Um, yes, we're monitoring. Uh, yes, we're providing them the best technology period or, um, at the time so that they can execute their day-to-day -day jobs so that the company can make their revenue so that we all have jobs and we can all um, take those vacations that we like during the summer months. And then um, that it just leads to you know better collaboration. Um, I, I've been on conversations with the executive leadership um, that has been very security aware and conversations with executive leadership that's not very security aware. Uh, they just want the, the nuts and the bolts of the conversation. Um, they don't want to understand what happened or why. They just want to know, did we lose money? Do we have an issue? What do we need to fix? How do we fix it and make sure it doesn't happen again? Those, those companies typically um, have, don't have the greatest company culture, and that leads to a lot of uh, employee retention issues, and you have a lot of turnover between the IT between the IT and the security teams. Uh, you've got a revolving door of analysts or, or you know, cybersecurity practitioners that really want to execute, but they just don't have the runway to do so because uh, the team's not very security aware or security conscious. So how do you build a security conscious culture that involves all the other teams? Um, you take the mystique away from security is probably the, the best first way to start this. Um, taking the mystique away or, or unveiling security um, gives the ability for users and, and other teams to understand that we're here to protect them and the company. We're not here to you know, make them feel bad because they got fish. Uh, we oftentimes... Uh, at one of my companies, we had a we had a board of you know top people who got fished, and it it was very open and a lot of it was lighthearted fun, but it also created a sense of you know hey I'm going to get made fun of if I click on this link, so I really have to be sure that I know what this link is uh, before I click on it and. Oftentimes that led to a lot of false reporting on potential spam emails or phishing emails. And it, it didn't create, you know, the greatest environment that we were looking to accomplish. We thought we were doing the right thing, um, but we weren't, we were, 
you know, just kind of pointing fingers, but not making them security aware. And we weren't building a security conscious culture. We we're building a culture of shame. And that was the last thing that we wanted. So you have to make sure that when you're unveiling security, you're doing it in the right way so that people feel protected and they feel like they have the ability to speak up and point out things that they think may or may not look safe. Um, a lot of this helps you understand um, the types of emails that your users are getting, the links that they expect to get and what they expect to clink, uh, click on and what they don't expect to click on. And that also gives you the ability to build a better security awareness training module uh, for your users. But when we talk about IT and security, um, how you get them involved is you make sure that they're communicating. You've got, you have to make sure that they have access to the right resources. You have to make sure that they're getting trained and they've got the right skills to execute in their job. And then you have to make sure that they know what, what their responsibilities are so that they commu can communicate with leadership and we can build a better culture across the organization and all work effectively and efficiently together, but openly and honestly. So I was expecting a couple of questions. Um, I know I went through this a little bit fast, um, about, about 23 minutes. Um, I do see that we had a, a context joke. Um, did you hear about the man who lost his left arm and left leg? Said, don't worry, he's all right now. Um, I love that joke. Um, <laughs> I, I am a, a connoisseur of dad jokes myself, um, so I really appreciate that. Um, but most of all, uh, thank you, Runecast, for having me today. Um, I know that we went kind of quick, um, so I know we have about 10 minutes left. I'm here for you know any questions, anything anyone wants to talk about, I'm definitely here, um, or we can all get a uh, coffee break and uh, enjoy some time before the next session. Uh, before anyone drops any questions into the chat, uh, I would probably have one. Um, if you can give an example of uh, some internal trainings that you've done or you've experienced and what was good or what was bad about them, something to yep. maybe learn from. Absolutely. Um, internal trainings are great, right? Um, I, I like internal trainings with tools like Sim. Um, so one of the, one of the things that we did is, um, when I was, I was leading a professional services organization, um, at my last company and we were responsible for implementing the SIM within organizations. So we did a, we did a big lunch and learn with our security team and our IT team to get them more involved in our product, right? Um, there's a, a big sense of, of being able to use your own tool or eat your own dog food, as a lot of people say. So we did a, a large uh, lunch and learn on what it actually takes to implement the SIM in an organization with our internal teams, right? So that they understood the process of what our professional services team is doing and how they're working with IT teams and security teams to get data into the platform. And that really, that really got those two teams talking about, you know, API credentials, um, sharing of credentials to get data in, how we were streaming data, and how we were querying data. So the, the things that went really good is the fact that we got IT and security on the same call and started having conversations about our own data and what we were logging internally. And it led to them understanding why the platform was so important to organizations and why they had to be able to talk about the data going into the platform so that they could each use it for their own uh, use cases and investigations, right? With IT, it's, hey, who's logging into what? Um, should they have access to that? And security is like, hey, that IP address looks kind of funny. Um, are you sure you were supposed to be there? Um, and, and being able to develop that relationship so that they were both comfortable in what was streaming into the platform and why. And things that we, we really learned that we had to improve on is that not everyone understands why you're doing the things that you're doing, right? Um, if I'm looking at EDR agent activity, I don't know that the IT team cares because it's part of the uh, software portfolio and it's just supposed to be installed, right? Um, so the thing that 
we, we got into a little bit of a, a nitpicky argument because they didn't understand the actual use case of the activity on the endpoint compared to why security cared that there was actually activity because it showed that the agent was healthy and that it was, you know, it was doing what it was supposed to do. So it, it, it created a little bit of a tense situation because it was the, well, I don't care um, that it has activity. I care that it's installed compared to, hey, I actually care that it has activity. Having no activity presents me an issue that I have to investigate further. So it really showed like the, the dichotomy of issues between responsibility and goals, right? Because they had a goal of, hey, I need 95% of my managed assets to have this. And security is like, no, I need, you know, 95% of them to have activity. This, you know, 10, 15% that has an agent, you say, but isn't checking in or isn't doing something, that's actually a greater risk to us than, you know, not having it installed at all. Um, so it, it got a little tense for a little while. Um, we should have done a, a better job during our lunch and learns of setting the objectives and the priorities of the call. Um, but at the end of the day, it ended up turning out really, really good. Um, we, you know, we kind of separated people. Uh, Zoom has uh, those uh, breakout rooms. So we kind of separated the two teams for a little bit um, and, you know, let them listen in, but separately where they couldn't chat with each other. Um, so those are, those are things that went really good. Um, I've seen, uh, you know, all sorts of lunch and learns from um, CRM tools to, you know, installing EDR agents to, you know, firewall troubleshooting, um, all of those things. You, you just have to have the right target audience. And whenever you're taking someone's lunchtime, you have to be very explicit on what, what you're going to accomplish and why it's important to them. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, every fun, uh, every time when you're entering uh, someone's lunch time, it, there has to be a very specific reason for that. <laughs> uh, that, that was a great uh, answer. Thank you for that. Um, and you mentioned that um, it, it was a lunch and learn. So was this a series uh, of calls uh, over a certain period of time or you have uh, did it once and cleared up the communication in between the teams uh, during one time session? So we, we schedule them out usually. Um, so whenever we do it, I start very small. Um, I've done this at three different companies. I start very small at first. I start with my team. Hey, what can we learn from each other? What should we be promoting to the business? Um, and then, uh, so we start with team, we'll probably do a month of lunch and learns with the team. Uh, every Thursday, we'll do a lunch and learn and we'll accomplish four goals over the month. And then on that fifth Thursday, we'll come together as a team, what worked, what didn't work, um, and why did it or didn't it work. From there, we'll reassess, we'll kind of uh, look at the content that we were presenting, we'll, we'll uh, basically rehash it in a, in a live call with everyone and they'll say, hey, yes or no, and then we'll bring in a second team. Right. And then we'll do lunch and learns with second team. What do we want to learn from them? What do we want to teach them? Um, and then at the end of that four weeks, we'll do another one between the two teams. Hey, what worked? What didn't work between the two teams? And from there, like, it just ever evolves. You introduce a third team. And then eventually, you know, you've got, um, but as you introduce more teams, obviously the cadence spreads out because not every team is going to meet every week on a Thursday from, you know, 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. during lunch. Um, so you spread it out. Maybe it goes to biweekly, maybe it goes to monthly, but you have that ability where you're still consistently meeting um, and you're teaching each other things as well as learning and getting that feedback that you're constantly communicating um, and the series just evolves. Um, unfortunately, you know, as new employees come in, um, they're like, hey, you're on like part 36 of this 170 part series. Where's parts one through 35 and how do I get caught up? Um, so we recommend recording them a lot where, where possible um, or, you know, getting the cliff notes from someone. Uh, that's a great insight, actually. Thank you very much. And I'm looking at the chat and we have uh, a question here. Uh, how do we address the overlap between these two teams? Um, oh. <laughs> um, addressing overlap is, um, it is one of the hardest things to do. Um, the the first thing, um, the first thing that you have to do when it, when addressing overlap between two teams, um, it's called the principle of charity. 
Um, if you've taken some communication classes, things like that, it's called principle of charity. Um, so often, whenever there's overlap, people get offended. They take things personally because they feel like it's their responsibility. Um, and when someone else feels like it's their responsibility to execute on their job too, um, people, one person or the other will just go ahead and do whatever it is that needs to be done. Um, and that leaves someone you know, feeling as if someone else did their job. Um, so whenever I talk to my teams or teams that are have competing uh, priorities or the same priority, uh, I tell them to operate on the principle of charity. And that the principle of charity states that you're assuming that someone is doing something with the best intention at in mind. Um, so you have to take some of the personal feelings out of it, uh, which is very hard because human nature says, if this is mine, I'm supposed to do it. I don't know why you did it. I am now offended that you did my job for me. Um, so whenever you, you start addressing overlap, you have to operate on the principle of charity and you have to open up that communication to make sure that the, the two teams or, or the two individuals that have the overlap of responsibility are communicating and break down why one person did it compared to the other. And that gives you the ability to identify areas in the next term, uh, where you can execute. Um, while there might be overlap, it might be overlap in the sense that one part is owned by one team, the second part is owned by another team, or there's responsibility of a shared, uh, a shared responsibility matrix that needs to be filled out uh, between the, the two teams addressing that overlap. Racy models obviously help everyone understand who's responsible for what, and it opens up that dialogue so that you can understand what you're trying to execute on and why one team or another should do X, Y, Z. Um, so addressing the overlap, the first thing that you have to do is you have to communicate. Um, then you have to define the responsibility. I, I love racy matrices or shared responsibility models. Um, they give you the ability to identify. And then if you, you're still having issues, um, I would project plan it out. Um, just break down the task. Um, the task is, we'll say, installing EDR agents. Cool, you're querying the machine, see if the machine's online. IT responsibility. Hey, you're preparing uh, the EDR package, that's security. Hey, you're installing the agent. Hey, that's back to IT. Hey, you're testing the agent, that's back to security. Hey, now you're confirming, and maybe that's a, a neutral third party that's saying, hey, both parties did everything that we expected them to do. Um, and the goal was accomplished and we have no more issues. Um, so, you know, those are always my recommendations. Uh, but the first thing has to be communication.